It's 1918. The world is already weakened and exhausted, limping toward the end of a global conflagration, the deadliest war in human history to that time. But as if that weren't bad enough, a worldwide pandemic starts. It will be called the Spanish flu, but the first case may have sprung up in March in Fort Riley, Kansas, my birthplace. Great. Within months, this deadly strain of influenza had spread around the globe. Before it was all over, it had infected over half a billion people, killing between 50 and 100 million, about 3 to 5 percent of the world's population. If that happened today, we'd lose 360 million souls, more than the population of the United States. It was one of the most horrific natural disasters in human history. Guess what? It's flu season again. Hi, I'm Jonathan Sullivan, and welcome back to Grey Steel. The 1918 pandemic was a particularly nasty one, but the flu is always serious business. Every year, flu burns across our planet, spread by coughing, sneezing, and personal contact, infecting up to 5 million people and killing up to half a million, particularly the very young, the elderly, pregnant women, and people with chronic health problems. It's a big deal. The flu is not a severe cold. It's the flu. It's caused by one of several strains of influenza virus, a family of RNA viruses, of which three types can infect humans, A, B, and C. One of the problems here is that all three of these types can also infect other animals, making the flu virus a type of zoonosis, or a disease that can be transmitted from critters to people. Influenza pandemics are due to influenza A virus. Influenza A viruses are categorized on the basis of two types of protein antigens they all carry, the H or hemagglutinin antigen and the N or neuraminidase antigen. So, for example, the Spanish flu pandemic was caused by an H1N1 flu virus, while the Hong Kong flu of 1968 was caused by H3N2, and the bird flu was caused by an H5N1 variant. These serotypes can be important clues to the virulence of the particular flu strain a patient has, and rapid tests are now available to help doctors make better decisions about treatment and prognosis. Symptoms of the flu? Well, unless you've never watched a TV commercial in October, you know what they are. Fever, fatigue, cough, congestion, sore throat, runny nose, watery eyes, muscle aches. Oh my God, the muscle aches and sometimes nausea, vomiting, rash, and more severe symptoms as well. It can get ugly. Treatment is mostly supportive. Rest, fluids, and analgesics and antipyretics, which basically means acetaminophen, Tylenol, which is a great medicine when used properly. Children and teens need to stay away from aspirin because it can lead to nasty complications with the flu. Antibiotics have no effect on the flu itself. However, sometimes the flu can be complicated by a bacterial pneumonia, which is kind of a big deal, and then you're usually going to be talking hospital admission and antibiotics. You've all heard about antivirals, like Tamiflu. Tamiflu is Oseltamivir, an antiviral with activity against neuraminidase antigen we spoke of earlier. So it's a neuraminidase inhibitor, which blocks the spread of newly produced virus from infected cells. And it can be used to fight influenza A and B. So hey, we're good. We've got a backup plan then, right? Well, oseltamivir and related medications are great to have in our arsenal. But like all medications, they have side effects. Vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, even seizures. That doesn't sound like much more fun than the flu. And these medications aren't as effective as you'd hope. Antivirals reduce the duration of symptoms by about half a day to maybe a day, and they're only recommended if they can be started during the first 48 hours of the illness. Oseltamivir and its cousins are more valuable for high-risk patients, again, people at the extremes of age, immunocompromised people, and pregnant women. Beyond that, the risk-benefit trade-off isn't that great. They're not wonder drugs. Check out the links in the doobly-doo for more. So, when it comes to the flu, 
the best approach is to not get it in the first place. And here, there are some simple, low-cost approaches that can pay big dividends. First off, wash your hands. Now, this is always a good idea, but during flu season, it becomes critical. Flu can be spread by direct contact, including contact with contaminated surfaces. So wash your paws. Second, keep your hands off yourself. Avoid putting unwashed hands in your eyes, nose, or mouth to avoid auto-inoculation. Third, you can wear a mask if you're going to be around people you know or suspect to have the flu, which might mean, you know, the bus, the mall, or the ER. Wearing masks is a big deal already in some countries like Japan, where it's expected, although the actual effectiveness is unclear, and in the U.S. it still kind of looks funny. Flu is definitely spread by aerosolized droplets, though, so it's worth considering, especially if you're in a high-risk group. The fourth strategy is the most important, and it's the real message of this episode. Get your flu shot. Seriously, every year a new vaccine is made up to protect against the most likely strains of the virus to circulate. Unless you have an honest-to-God known medical allergy to hen eggs or some other component of the vaccine, You've just got to do this. And in fact, there are new vaccines grown up in arthropod cells, so you don't even have the egg allergy excuse anymore. Is it 100% effective in preventing the flu? Absolutely not. For one thing, predicting flu strains is a bit like predicting the weather, and it takes about two weeks for your immune system to process the vaccine and get you up to speed, during which time you can become infected. The effectiveness of the vaccine varies wildly from year to year. You pays your money and you take your chances, but it's better to take your chances with the vaccine than without it. And of course, we've all heard that the flu vaccine causes terrible side effects. No, not compared to the actual flu, they're not. First of all, you cannot get the flu from the flu vaccine. It's just not possible. The flu vaccine can cause flu-like symptoms in some people, but these are generally self-limited and fairly mild. Compared to a full-blown case of influenza, they're a cakewalk. There are also rare cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, a serious neurological disorder, and that, of course, is a big deal. But this is literally a one in a million event, or even a one in 10 million event, far less risky than, say, getting into your car to drive to the ER because you've got the flu. We've been using this vaccine for a long time now, and the data is pretty clear. The risk-benefit ratio for influenza vaccination is way, way in favor of vaccination. It's not even close. And this is especially true if you're in a high-risk demographic. Most large health organizations now require all caregivers to be immunized every year for your protection and theirs and it's been found to be both cost-effective and to reduce patient deaths. Now, if you venture out into that swamp we call the internet, you're going to find a lot of misinformation, ranging from assertions of non-efficacy to just crazy wacko tinfoil hat crap, like the flu vaccine causes cancer. All of it is either without evidence or built around interpretations of the evidence that can be most charitably described as obtuse. The flu vaccine isn't perfect, but it's definitely one of the perks of technological civilization, and it might even save your life, or at least a week of work and play. I can't recommend it strongly enough. And now that this video is shot, I'm gonna go get mine. Have you had your flu vaccine this year? Go down to the comments and tell us. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Grace Deal. Our content is for educational and infotainment purposes only and will never be offered as medical advice for any particular person, patient, disease, or condition. If you have questions about your health, you should work closely with your physician. Thanks to our Olympic patrons, Laura and James Welcher, and to all the other patrons on Patreon who help make the Grace Deal channel possible. A welcome to our newest patrons, Lars Bergstrom, Alex Wolfson, and Paul Fackler. And a big shout out to our newest power patrons, Emily and Diego. If you'd like to help us make more videos like this, just go to patreon.com slash gracedeal. 
And whatever you do, don't forget to go to youtube.com slash and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.